Belgian waffles. Belgian waffles. Belgian waffles. Splash in the coffee. Belgian waffles. Belgian waffles. Belgian waffles. Splash in the coffee. It's so close. It's so close to becoming cold that it's like... I'm not even sure. I don't think I want to drink it. <sighs> New mug, though. That's kind of fun. I actually just... Hold on. If you can wait, I'm just going to finish this because it's, it's really... It's truly about to be too cold to drink. I got a blackberry tea at World Market. <sighs> Do you ever just... Do you ever just, are you, you're just, you're sitting in bed, or you're lying in bed, and it's one in the morning or so, and you just get a feeling in your stomach, and the feelings is the words, hey, man, if you don't, look, you haven't, you didn't do anything all day, it's one in the morning, and you don't even get comfortable, because you're not going to sleep tonight, and, because, it, because, it, honestly, you, your brain is so empty of content or anything to do that if you don't honestly do anything tomorrow if you don't have any tangible a video i want a, a video if you don't have a tangible video by the end of tomorrow then honestly i don't even know what you're doing with your life and you're not going to sleep tonight because of that thought so then you don't sleep at all um and then when you wake up the next day you're like i guess i gotta do anything i guess i just if even if it's just it means nothing if even if i talk about nothing I just have to have anything to show for a day because the day before I just had nothing for, for just a brief moment. All your self-worth is sort of in a YouTube video. <laughs> this guy. Ah, oh, so I'm here. Two minutes into a video and I've said nothing. Stellar. Um, what else? What have I been up to? Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been to the thrift store a lot recently, so that's been nice. And why do I bring that up? Well, because, uh, for multiple reasons. One, first of all, hey, you know what I just realized? Thrift stores never sell appliances. And people definitely get rid of appliances that still work. Why is that? So, uh, my theories are, as it stands right now, one, maybe because I think a lot of people, when their appliances die, they put it out on the side of the road, and then people just pick it up. And they're like, I'll, try, I'll plug this in at home, see if it works. I'm not talking like little appliances. Because like, you go to a Goodwill and the whole back row is just toaster ovens and George Foreman grills. I'm talking about dryers. A dryer? A washing machine? Why, don't, no, why aren't those at thrift stores? Not that I really wanted one. That's not really what I go to thrift stores for. You know how there's like, you know, thrift store culture for, you know, my generation is. We go, we find the quirky stuff and the things. Um, like a lamp. You know, a lamp that I would have always thought in my life, that's hideous. But now it's like, okay, I guess if my whole room's going to look like that, then that's fine. So like, I, you know, I go there and I'm like, I'll find a quirky mug. I found a quirky mug that's got a painting of uh, some, like in England, there used to be like those horse riding fox hunters, you know? I found a little painting of those on a mug and I pu put a little potted plant in it. So also, I don't, I just maybe, maybe, you know, maybe thrift stores don't want to deal with an appliance. Also, maybe they just get bought really quickly. Maybe that's why I never see them. Anyway, every time I go, it's just armchairs and rows and rows and rows of elementary school t-shirts and every once in a while, like a fun trench coat, but it's for ladies, so I don't tend to get them. So what else is new? Well, I've been looking a lot into, I've been sort of keeping myself busy. Okay, I've been spending a lot of time just obsessing over what happened with Edward Snowden in 2013. So here's what happened as far as I can tell. I'll give you the gist. Snowden worked for the CIA or maybe the NSA. They're the same thing. It doesn't even matter. Look, I don't want to be a conspiracy. I don't want to just start a conspiracy for no reason, but this one's for fun. So I'll start it. The NSA and the CIA are the exact same thing. You can't prove it otherwise. He works in counterterrorism, So he starts working for, you know, a elite group of online soldiers. I don't know why I put quotation marks around soldiers. They're, you know, they're serving our country in their own way. He, he realizes, whoa, hey, if I just type words into search bar, I can see basically people's webcams and stuff. I can see all the text messages they sent privately. I can see what they wrote in the forums. I can track their IP addresses. I know where it's coming from, the data, the numbers, 
crunching the web streams, you know what I mean? So he realizes we can all, we can all, and by we can all, I mean the NSA or the CIA, it doesn't matter which one. Uh, they can see everything, and they're not really abusing it. They have the capacity to abuse it. They could see anything. Ugh, oh, could it be voyeuristic? And probably it was. But they weren't using it for malicious reasons. They were just, I mean, unless you count probably racism and Islamophobia as you know, malicious reasons, then yeah, they were probably using it for malicious reasons. So they're only spying on people they consider terrorists, which is a whole other problem, thanks Bush. Yeah, so he realizes that all this, they have the capacity to be spying on basically everybody in our country. He realizes that, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna ugh, play it safe. Basically what's preventing it from being a war crime is FISA? FISA? It's basically like, hey, you don't need a warrant if it's terrorism, okay? You know what I mean? Like, you know how we have warrants for stuff? Well, the internet's different, and you don't need a warrant to search people's internet history for terrorism. Okay, that's not true. And so he's like, okay, how far does that go? And they're like, pretty much as far as you think it should. So he's collected, he has collected the documentation of secret, what are actually secret courts. There are secret courts that are dealing with war crime stuff that are not like civil courts, so nobody else is allowed to learn about it. You know how like, if it happens in a public court, everybody gets to know about it? Well, there are private military courts, and they're deciding what, you know, we can know about what's happening. So anyway, he basically gets the documents together that have allowed for us to, that, that have made the specific provisions for what is counterterrorism, internet spy, with the computer boys. He puts all the documents together on what I can, what I in my head are picturing is a bunch of little USB drives. They might have been floppy disks. Boy, is the internet wild. He flies to Hong Kong. He meets journalists in Hong Kong. Already he knows. Okay, now, the Chinese government I think already knew that he was trying, that he had arranged a meeting to meet with journalists from I think The Guardian, which is British, and The WAPO, Washington Post. He's up in this hotel room. Here comes all the Guy, the journalist guys, it's like four people, they're in there, they're recording an interview of him talking, this is a camera, and he hands them over the documents that he has stolen, but they should have been pro public because they deal with public information, so it's technically treason because those are secret courts, but, but really, oh, what's happening? Right, so the ho journalists meet him up in the, the hotel, uh, they record the interview, the interview goes out, everybody's watching it and then all the news organizations are posting this interview with Edward Snowden and Edward Snowden everybody sees his face and he's like I'm Edward Snowden and it's critical that the people of America know what is happening because all their information is up to anybody man now I'm Owen Wilson and what's gonna happen with our with our data you know what I mean Kachow. The government is scrambling. Whoa, nobody was supposed to know this. We gotta find this dude. They're analyzing the video of him in this hotel room to see if by the view of the, maybe like the, through the window of the reflection in his glasses, they can tell where they filmed this at. By the time they get there, he's already gone. Edward Snowden and maybe a journalist or his lawyer or something have boarded a plane to Moscow. They get to Moscow. They're in the, you ever seen the movie The Terminal? <laughs> movie The Terminal is a Tom Hanks movie. Anyway, it's based on a true story. A guy from a country, the country, while, because he plays a guy from like a, a, a Eastern European country that doesn't actually exist. I think it's called Krakosia or something. It's not real. Anyway, he gets on a plane in Krakosia, flies to New York City. While he's in the air, war breaks out in the country. The country no longer exists because it's broken into civil war and the government has had a coup. So technically no government proceedings can continue because the government is, has been overthrown. He gets to New York. Stanley Tucci runs the airport. It's not really Stanley Tucci, he's playing a character. And he's like, hey, you can't come through here. War just broke out in your country. And he's like, what? I don't, that doesn't make, I don't remember that happening. And they show him the TV and he's like, okay, well, I see what you mean. Uh, and so they're like, you can't come to our country. You can't come into New York City. You're not a citizen of the country you flew here from because that country doesn't exist anymore. And he's like, well, what do I do? And they're like, I don't know, this doesn't happen that much. So they make him sit in the terminal waiting. But war lasts a long time. So for like, I don't know, it's a year or something. In real life, it was like years on end. So he ends up just living there. He like finds a part of the airport terminal that like nobody ever comes to and he makes himself a whole little house there. It's great, it's a great movie, you gotta watch it. He gets a job working as a construction worker for the airport and that's how he makes his money to pay for stuff like Burger King that's in the terminal, that's in the airport. Then like he buys himself fancy suits in the airport shopping center. Like, like he ends up making a whole life in this airport terminal because he's not allowed into New York City, but eventually he gets allowed into New York City because war, the war f f ends and he like, he's been battling it out with Stanley Tucci, but Stanley Tucci can't keep him from, because he's made a whole little community in this terminal. Everybody loves him there, so they all help him get to New York City. Anyway, I don't think that's how it happened in real life. So, what does Edward Snowden do? It's not similar to that really, I just kind of felt like talking about the terminal. Snowden gets to Moscow, okay, while he was in the air, 
from Hong Kong to Moscow, the United States revokes his passport. So he gets to um, Russia, and they say, you can't come into our country. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And they're like, I don't know, wait here for 39 days while we figure out what to do with you. Vladimir Putin hears the story. He's like, this guy trying to help help uh, destabilize, you know, American intelligence. I'm I'm here for that. And Edward Snowden's like, okay, this is the hero I didn't know I needed. And I'm not really sure I get along with Putin, but great. So he waits in the terminal for 39 days. All he does there is he's got friends in Moscow and they bring him food and stuff. And he's just sitting in this airport terminal. That's not really an important part of this story. That happens to a lot of people, I guess, way more than I thought it happens. People get stuck in airport terminals because they can't legally come into the country. Ha! Ah, he, uh, they let him into the country because Russia grants him asylum. So yeah, so the United States is trying to get him back, but Russia's like, no, he can legally stay here. So they give him asylum for a year after a year, six days after that, like, temporary visa expires. Russia says, you know what, you can have three years worth of temporary residency in Russia because we're still trying to figure out what to do with you and we don't want you to go back to the United States. So he's, so he lives in Russia and then in 2019 or something, he got... Uh, permanent residency. He and his wife live there. They're the cutest couple in the world. Gosh, we love him. She's an acrobat and a blogger. He's Edward Snowden, treason, treasonist and hero. Treasonist? Traitor? Anyway, that's what happened with Edward Snowden. So I wasn't really planning on talking about that, uh, but what's new? That's what happens every time I... That's what happens every time I try to sit down and make a video. I just start talking about nothing. Uh, what else was I going to talk about? I found a beekeeping vlog. Okay, it was a blog, and uh, the lady on there has a honey company out of San Francisco. She talks about a lot of stuff on there. I learned what queen spotting is. You have to keep up with where a queen is. In front, you have frames in the box. So you have a box that has a hive in it, and in each frame you have the, they build their little nests. I don't know what it's called. The bees live in there. Uh, they build the combs. And some of them are for more procreation. Some of them are like more like what you call the nursery of the hive. And some of them are more for honey production. So each frame is kind of different. And the queen will move in between them because she mates some. She needs the larvae to be fed. But also she mainly stays in the nursery. So she's in between the, all of them. And you have to take out frames at a time to look for honey and stuff. I don't know. But you have to queen spot because sometimes you'll pull the frame out and it like... It can be, you can, you lose a few bees most of the time when you do this, just because, like, they can get crushed and stuff. You have to, you have to learn how to queen spot, and it's also important because sometimes you have to replace your queen, sometimes you have to use what are called queen excluders in a frame so that your queen doesn't accidentally try to set up shop. That's, that's gentrification. So I've been bored. Yeah, I've been bored. Oh, oh, also, and this is important, this is something that I have been meaning to, I just, I just, well, here's what happened, I just decided in my head the next video I make, I was going to do Gear Watch. Uh, Gear Watch is, okay, Gear Watch is something I do for myself, but I thought that I could bring it to the internet community. Gear Watch is where, so I do it like every, every year I just try to keep up with what's happening to Richard Gere, uh, the actor. So yeah, if you don't know who Richard Gere is, he was uh, in Pretty Woman, so he plays the kind of, the <laughs> jerk that, uh, Sandra Bullock, yeah, it's Sandra Bullock or Ju Julia Roberts. Yeah, it might be Julia Roberts. Um, in Pretty Woman, we all know the movie Pretty Woman, and we all remember that it's Julia Roberts in it. So he's the guy in it, and uh, he's Hollywood's like least entertaining celebrity personality probably ever. Um, he just doesn't do like anything, and he's just like a guy. He's a major celebrity, and his net worth is huge, and he stars in stuff still. But he's just like, he, to me, he's just like America's dad. But not even like America's like dad energy. He doesn't have any energy. He was in Hachi, which is about a dog. So now he mostly does like movies for older folks on, you know, probably like Lifetime. He was bigger in the 90s. He was kind of a heartthrob, but like if you, if even in the 90s you were kind of into older men, then you were like Richard Gere, because he's just like a quiet older gentleman who's already starting to get great temples. And that was when he was like, you know, 32, so. Uh, Gear Watch, what's up with Richard Gere? Thanks for asking. A few things to note on Richard Gere. So about a week ago, he appeared on a, um, he appeared for a, a international, like I think the, the Jerusalem Post uh, periodical that comes out about what's sort of happening in the international Jewish community. So he came out with a statement, let's see, I wrote it down, hold on. This is journalism at its finest. I see, I use paper. Oh, he was denouncing the Israel-Palestinian conflict. He said, um, his words were, uh, his words were, um, Israelis won't have a home until Palestinians have a home. Basically what he's saying is there's a lot of people in the Jewish community who 
Uh, not to, you know, well, I'm not going to explain Palestine, Israel, but, you know, a lot of Zionists don't, you know, believe that in, you know, they believe in the establishment of the Holy Land. So we was basically saying we have to get along. We have to, well, a lot of people agree on a two-state solution. I don't want to speculate about whether or not Richard Gere is pro-Palestine or pro-Israel. He's pro-peace. And that's what's important because we can get along about this, but also I'm so very removed from the conflict that I'm actually not sure if that statement is true and I don't really get to say it. So great. Uh, what else is new uh, with Richard Gere? Okay, here's a kind of fun one. So Martha Stewart, I guess, is well, she's got to be bored out of her mind uh, because all she did during COVID was like, because like she's she, her whole thing has always been like, I love my home. Yeah, so all this whole year she's been doing Zoom interviews and like everybody's talk show and all this stuff to be like, how did COVID sangrias? Like she just does that kind of stuff, like quilting for the COVID, you know, for the COVID times. Like, and, uh, but now, and also now she's friends with Snoop Dogg, who I think is trying to set her up on dates. This is not what I meant to talk about. Anyway, so yeah, so she, she's, you know, she's been big for people who are trying to have, you know, uh, apocalypse fun at home. And now I think she's kind of exhausted her options on things she can talk about. So like at this point, where is she going to really go from there? Uh, well now I'll tell you what she does now. Now she appears on talk shows and interview shows and she talks uh, like about Richard Gere some. So this is a story she tells. Richard Gere was going through Instagram, saw on Instagram that Martha Stewart had posted a picture of herself driving around her property on a ATV. What's the brand? Polaris? I think Pol a Polaris like ATV, like a four-wheeler. Here's, here's Martha Stewart, the sweetheart of American cross-stitching, and here she is on a Polaris ATV, uh, gripping it and ripping it on her sort of dirt bike across her property. Richard Gere sees this picture, and he's like, I, I, I want a dirt bike. Now he wants an ATV. I guess he's always wanted one. He sees her with it, and he's like, Finally, the time has come. Us celebrities can come out as ATV lovers. This is kind of where Richard Gere's at in his life. A lot of people would call it a midlife crisis. I call it a fun guy having fun. So he sees Martha Stewart's Instagram like that. It's incredible to me that he even has Instagram. I want him to get a TikTok. And if this video, I, maybe this will be the video of mine that blows up. And if this is the video that blows up, Get Richard Gere on TikTok. I hadn't even thought about it, but a podcast that I listened to mentioned re getting Richard Gere on TikTok, and we gotta get Gere on TikTok. He would be not, he would be a, such a non, not engaging TikTok persona that it would almost counteract everything else on TikTok. TikTok's gone a little too far. I think we can all agree, and I think we could all, we all could do with the neutralizing energy that Richard Gere brings to every film performance he's ever been in. He is on Instagram. He calls Martha Stewart on the telephone calls Martha Stewart on the telephone and he's like, I gotta get a ATV. And she's like, great, oh, they're so fun. Uh, and he's like, yeah, but nobody's selling them anywhere. And she's like, well, maybe I could hook you up with somebody. He's like, can I just buy one of yours? She's like, absolutely not. They laugh it off. I forget what even I was saying. Oh, anyway, so Richard Gere, yeah. Anyway, Richard Gere has been calling Martha Stewart by her estimates probably once a week, asking for this, <laughs> this four wheeler. So, so that was Gear Watch 2021. You know, it's new to the channel. It's not new to my life, but it's new to the channel. And uh, so in, a, in, a, in about a year, expect Gearwatch 2022. Because I think Gear is going to get into some big stuff uh, in the re with the remainder of 2021. Uh, yeah, so great. I did a video. Anyway, okay, so good. So I, just, so I did something with my day. That's good for me. Uh, yeah. Bye. I don't have a lot of storage space left. I'm back, so... <laughs> <laughs> Just answer me honestly. Do you want this? any of this? No. <laughs> you can put the audio in. The audio of it. Well... Oh, bartenders are hot. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop that and restart it for you. I can't end it. <sighs> one moment. So, oh, just say one thing at a time and don't do this to yourself every time because now you have a 14 minute long video that you're going to have to edit in a matter of minutes and you're going to jump out the window when you do it. Okay. Um, all the comments on this video are just going to be, man, Nick's really falling apart at this point, huh? Honestly, thanks for nothing, Bush. President of 9-11, more like president of... Stupid. That's all, folks. What's nice about the Republican Party is that it's falling apart. So, Ugh. Burden the internet with your problems. I will, thank you. Uh, you know what's really fun is ending a thought on Richard Gere has been calling Martha Stewart once a week to ask for a four-wheeler, but not fully getting through the thought and then taking a two-hour break and then coming back to the video to finish the video 
and having to say the sentence, Richard Gere has been calling Martha Stewart two times a week asking her for a four-wheeler. Uh, so yeah, um, uh...